the exorcist uh this so before i became a huge stanley kubrick stan a stanley um yeah i uh i <laughs> Uh, my, I remember a filmmaker friend of mine, we're, we were making films together at the time, and I forgot how it came up, but he asked me, like, hey, like, what's your favorite horror movie? And I said, you know, there are a lot of good ones, but kind of like, I don't remember my exact answer, but I do know I was leaning towards, like, there were like a few that were just on even ground. I think I said maybe The Omen, The Exorcist, and The Shining were just kind of like my three favorites and it's hard for me to pick one and then we got it it just got really combative and um shitty or as they would say in these days <laughs> toxic from there <laughs> and, and we started yes. like clashing heads because in he's like he's like dude kubrick like fucking kubrick what the hell are you talking about i'm like what are you what are you talking about like they're all good movies and that's 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 the the origin story of where i started to become a kubrick fan where i started like you know really diving into his movies i'm like oh the shining is the greatest shit in the world man it's just fucking awesome and it's better than everything else well prior to that this was up there with my favorite horror movies and i think i, I mean it's, this is a film i've revisited a few times but i haven't revisited it in a while so i was excited to get back into this and to see like what i would think about it you know since i, th I think that was the last time like i really put any real thought into this film but it was it was it was fun to revisit it and i didn't know that the director also did um china uh, the french connection which is mm. another awesome movie that i love um yes. that freaking did and uh so i listened to some of his director commentary oh my god his director commentary was just <laughs> dude I, I listened to interviews director commentary right up on him He's an incredibly fascinating guy, but he is such a guy from the 70s. It's just oh, yeah. mind-boggling. But <laughs> but yeah, excited about the director, excited about the film, and uh, excited we got to do this, uh, get dive into this movie. Yeah, me too. Uh, this is a movie I first saw when I was 12 years old. Uh, it's kind of a, a bit of a side story, but uh, my brother and I, how oh, dare you go into a side story? <laughs> well, <laughs> someone you know. on this podcast going into side stories? <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> that, I know. that does so, not belong on this show. <laughs> this is why we need the professional logos because what happens in the show isn't professional. So we need something to be professional. Yeah. There yeah. you go. Yeah. So, but yeah, you know, this one summer, my brother and I, we had to sleep in the dining room because there were some renovations going on on the second floor of the house and we had to get out of our bedrooms and um and so we slept in the dining room and uh that was actually exciting because we call it the dining room but it was actually more like a family room in a way there was a tv so was, it. was it like a duplex where all the bedrooms were on the second floor and then everything else was on the, the, the ground floor? Uh, yeah it was it was a freestanding house so yeah it had bedrooms on the second floor and the main floor had a kitchen living room and dining room uh, mm -hmm. but we you know there was Cause yeah because like in new york you don't get that as much so for no. instance in my house it's it's not so much a duplex as it is that you know you have like it's almost broken up into different apartments when you get on the right. second floor you have your own set of you know so sure yeah well this was a just a freestanding house and uh and yeah the dining room for whatever reason we we usually ate in the kitchen as a family so the dining room we had a tv and there were some chairs and occasionally there might be you know a meal eaten in there but it was mainly just a place for the kids to watch tv um but uh so yeah being in the dining room and sleeping in the dining room that meant we had a tv and we could watch things late at night when you know we're supposed to be asleep so there you were lots of interest yeah we had cable um well that's the main thing because if you just have like network tv you're just staying up to watch like infomercials and stuff like that right <laughs> that's true yeah and i think in the early days we just had you know not cable we just had regular tv but at some point we got cable and um and yeah there were always interesting movies at midnight and, and one of them was the exorcist and of course i'd heard about it and i needed to see this movie you know and, and so i watched it and it 
of course it scared the crap out of me you know when i was 12 and uh and i remember actually when the movie was ending uh you know i knew it was ending i could tell we were at the end of the movie and things had kind of worked out okay and i i was so disturbed by everything i'd seen that i i was afraid to stay and watch the very end because i i know so many horror films would end with uh, one more scare you know like the evil would come back you know the monster would be alive and so i thought oh no 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 i can't i can't risk this so i actually left the room and i went to the bathroom and when i came back the credits were rolling and and as it turns out i was it was okay because the exorcist doesn't really have one of those kind of endings so i i could have stayed but that's how disturbed i was that i was just like i got to leave the room because if the if the evil comes back i'm not going to get to sleep you know i'm going to be awake all night so that was um definitely a, a seminal viewing experience for me and um uh, and of course i've seen the exorcist many many times over the years since then how old were you when you first saw it 12 i was 12 and uh yeah so it's it's definitely probably i think one of the best horror films uh, and i know a lot of people cite it as what they think is the greatest horror film and you know i i can see that i can see it's a very very good movie yeah i mean i despite the fact that i like the shining more uh i would consider this i i wouldn't argue with anyone that thought this was better because when you look at it from all aspects it's just not it's just not one category that makes a film good or successful you have to look at it from all quadrants so is it financially successful which the shining really wasn't it was it a cultural phenomenon the shining wasn't and was it critically acclaimed yeah they both were um was it is it a cult film yeah they both were are they both historically important yeah they both were so every aspects that the shining well the shining i guess was more cutting edge because of the steady camp stuff so from a technological pushing technology forward like you know pushing film forward uh, i guess the shining would have the edge there but for the most part a lot of the positives that the shining has the exorcist also has but then the exorcist has the commercial success and the cultural phenomenon that the shining never did um and also it spawned this was interesting watching it because you think of like Halloween and you think of Frankenstein and Friday the 13th and Hellraiser and Child's Play. You think of all these movies and when they're successful and they spawn these sequels, they're forming these franchises that go on and on and on and these characters that you dress up as as Halloween. But you're not really dressing up as anyone from Halloween. Like, I guess maybe you can dress up like Reagan, but for the most part, like you're not dressing up like characters from this movie. So you don't have like that that commercial like you know thing that keeps going where you you know you're making money off of of the dolls and things like that or the costumes. And the franchise, although I've heard like I think part three or something is like really good, the franchise wasn't really successful. I know it was sold recently to Blumhouse and there, there was a recent remake, but it wasn't and not a remake, a sequel in, in the lineage of, of the films. It wasn't really that. It, I think it was like bombed. It lost money. Um, but what's interesting about this film is despite the cultural phenomenon, the franchise didn't benefit from it but it almost created another subgenre of horror in exorcist movies so it, that i thought that was pretty interesting in that yeah the exorcist it's almost even though it's not a standalone movie it's almost a standalone movie because all the the success of the exorcist were other exorcist movies that didn't financially benefit the franchise. Like how many exorcist movies or movies with exorcists in a title aren't part of the exorcist? You can't say that about Friday the 13th. If you put Friday the 13th in your title, you're, you're, you're a sequel or you're gonna get sued, you know, but you can put the exorcist in a title and do the same things that the exorcist did and just be your own complete movie. So I, I thought that was interesting as well yeah uh and and you know what you're saying about friday the 13th even the the official sequels jason goes to hell and jason x 
they're not allowed to use Friday the 13th because they didn't buy the rights to the title. They just bought the rights mm -hmm. to the character. So that's really interesting too. But you're right. There's, there's so many exorcism movies. You know, the Italians really got into it, right? They, they saw this movie and they went, Ooh, we can do this. And they made all kinds of, and they really kind of ramped up the sex and the exploitation and all that stuff. And, we really made a lot of them quite sleazy. I think one of them was called the Sexorcist, maybe. <laughs> um, so yeah, you know, there was a huge phenomenon. And movies like The Omen that you mentioned, you know, I think they got made because of the success of The Exorcist. Was The Omen made... first? I don't think so. I think uh, this one was first, and then I think movies like The Omen and even the Amityville Horror that came out after. And there were a lot of sort of supernatural kind of movies that came out with big budgets. Um, and I think they uh, they were greatly influenced by the success of this movie because they realized, hey, we can make a big budget movie, uh, a horror movie, a supernatural movie, and we can possibly have a big hit. Okay. So, yeah, it's it's sort of had uh, not just direct ripoffs and sequels, but just you know, the idea of making these kind of big budget supernatural movies, The Exorcist kind of uh, led the way. Yeah, it's funny when you said the Omen thing because I was listening to this interview. I don't know if it was an interview or the commentary with Freakin because I, I, I did so much listening to his stuff, especially since we were delayed. Um, but he mentioned the Omen and he oh, yeah. mentioned Rosemary's Baby. So I guess when he spoke about this, this was after, like well after the movie came out then. Um, but yeah. the, before I, this, this interview I heard before I rewatched the movie. And this is where uh, one of the many fascinating things that I heard him say that just made me chuckle out loud to myself. Because uh, I, I listen to a lot of this stuff sometimes when I'm cycling to work and I'm just like cycling with these, my headset and just laughing to myself. People are looking at me like, what's this idiot doing? But um, he said that he actually insulted the Omen and Rosemary's Baby. He was like, yeah, I didn't want to do something like the omen or rosemary's baby i really want to do something really good i'm like what those <laughs> movies aren't good but yeah I, i'm paraphrasing but basically his main thought was he wanted to do something better than those movies and he viewed yeah. this movie as superior to those and in my mind i'm i always thought of them as similar because they all deal with like supernatural um they all have that slow paced 70s feel to them Mm -hmm. They all like uh, depend on like atmosphere. They're all in kind of urbanish settings, uh, so I, I view them as having a lot more in common than more having more different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do too, and I think those are both really good movies as well. So I don't know what he would be talking about, but uh, but you know, he's definitely a, an opinionated guy, I guess. Yeah. I think part of what he was saying was the the horror aspect of it, in that they more played into the horror aspects that he didn't want to play into. Oh yeah. And he wanted to make more feel like documentary feel, more real feel, and he wanted yeah. to eliminate like from the original script that I think the writer of the book did the script, and the original script had a lot of scares and he was like, take all this shit out. Like this is not why I like the book. I liked it because it was a good story. You like all this jump scare and all that. Take it all out. Like, stop yeah. making it a horror film. Let's just make it a, a real story. And uh, William Peter Blatty, I think, is the uh, the writer. So he actually made the original writer like change it more back to the book. Where it's usually yeah. the opposite. Usually the the writer <laughs> of the book is like, hey, keep it more like my book. And yes. then and the the director then changes it. But I thought that was interesting as well. Yeah, definitely, definitely, and. Uh... It's interesting too because uh, I think last time we talked, I mentioned that uh, one of my tests that I would sometimes put a movie to a horror movie was if you took the horror out of this, would this still be an interesting story? And I think that The Exorcist is a movie that you could actually take the horror out of it. You could take out the supernatural stuff, and you'd still be left with an interesting and a compelling story. I think about a, a mother and a daughter. Uh, dealing with uh, an illness that can't be diagnosed and all the horrors of that. You know, it's a, it could be just a very intense drama. I think it could be done. I think there is enough going on here. It, it doesn't feel like, again, like Friday the 13th, where if you took the horror out, you'd be left with nothing. You know, just campers 
hanging out. Yeah, I, 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 when I was watching the film, I think it was like 53 minutes in before anything like really like weird started happening. And I almost felt like, man, this film is so good. And the documentary feel, the slow pace, it's so much steeped in realism that I felt it would have benefited from what freaking was saying, but even to go a step further in that this happened to a little boy. I know the original priest that told him the story didn't want like the actual names or certain things to come out. But a lot of what surrounded the story was like, did this really happen? Is this real? Was it just like group uh, hysteria? Or was he, you know, was it just like a kid who was spasming out and, you know, you made the kid believe that the devil was there just so that would be a way to calm the kid down there was so much avenues of interpretation from the original story that I almost wish the movie did it that way so when you saw the first freak out and i think like reagan like her neck was like pulsating like almost like a frog when it breathes i was like man that's a great shot but you almost wish that shot wasn't there because if they would have just toned down the supernatural stuff a little bit where it was just like you as a viewer would say, I wonder if this is really happening or if it's not really. But Ooh. when those scenes happen, it's clear like, yeah, this is 100% supernatural, you know? Yeah. As I was thinking that, but then every time a supernatural scene happened, I'm like, like even though I, I thought like maybe the movie would be better without it, you're like, man, like that's an iconic shot. <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> you take out the supernatural, you take out all the iconic shots. The peas yeah. elevating over the bed, the bed lifting yeah. up, the furniture yeah. like attacking people, the head spin, the the crab walk down the stairs. It's like mm -hmm. every time I kept thinking, man, they should take this stuff out. But everything iconic about this film are those shots of the supernatural stuff. Yeah, for sure. And uh, I know what you mean. And in some ways, it would be interesting if it was, you know, subtle in terms of is it real is it not but i think it is kind of good that it does commit to it being real because uh you know so many movies you'd be left with that feeling like i don't know if this was real or not but here they're basically saying yeah it's real it's real and um uh, and i think it works you know i think it works on that level yeah i almost need to watch it again because i kind of watch it through the lens of man these first 53 minutes are really good <laughs> stick to what we're doing right now let's not go over the top so i almost need to watch it again um in going in with the perspective of i was wrong the supernatural stuff works let me rewatch it one more time um but even as is like i i i thought it was really well executed the supernatural stuff because it was proper build-up so it really paid off even like during the supernatural scenes there were breaks it, even in that climax there was that break where the two priests were sitting on the stairs or when the one priest and the mother was downstairs so there were like the, it paced out really well yeah yeah for sure and uh i think part of what i find interesting is that it's clearly real you know like this stuff is happening and yet they're still not getting enough evidence to prove that it's an actual possession you know like the church has certain things you know we need to hear this we need to see that you're seeing a lot of stuff here that's clearly clearly messed up you know um but yet it's still so i, I mean that kind of helps with the feel of okay it's we think it's real but at the same time there are people going i don't know if it's real you know so that kind of maintains that level of questioning i think uh, yeah the, the one the scene that made me i don't know if i laughed out loud but i laughed internally <laughs> I'm like, give me a fucking break. <laughs> like, <laughs> it was when uh, the um, the main the main priest, uh, what was his name again? Um, Father Karras. Yeah, Father Karras, uh, Jason Miller. When yes. he he came down and he said, "Well, you know, I did spray with holy water, but it was technically tap water." I'm like. Fucking, who cares if it's tap water? Like, how much supernatural shit do you need to see? Like, okay, yeah. so it's tap water. Who gives a fuck? Like, like you know, yeah. it's like, like if you see yeah. Superman flying around and he's like, he's, you know, he's like rescuing people and he's like 
using his laser vision. He's freezing, you know, fires and he's doing all this stuff. And then someone brings out kryptonite. And he's like, oh my God, kryptonite. But you're like, you know, this Superman, he seems like he has powers, but that wasn't real kryptonite. It was just like a green <laughs> rock. So I don't know if he really has all these powers. It's like, come on, dude, you know? Yeah, yeah. And it's like, you know, they, they want to hear the, you know, the possessed person speaking a language that they don't speak, you know, a foreign language. And one of my favorite moments, even going back to when I was a kid, where he, he records what he thinks is a foreign language. But then when he takes it to an expert, it turns out it's English backwards. Yeah. You know? So how is that less crazy <laughs> and less supernatural? How can you speak English backwards? I mean, there's clearly something supernatural happening there. But yeah, uh, yeah it's uh, it almost it's felt like a parody at that point, you know, just like yeah. Yeah. it's almost making fun of those tropes where it's like the reluctant hero, the authority figures that won't believe you. Almost like they yeah. were like making fun of those tropes. But yeah, that, that was I think all that happened in the same sequence, all those things. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah, definitely, um, definitely a worthwhile movie. Definitely an interesting movie to dive into. And uh, yeah, um, I, I, like I said, I, I almost want to rewatch it again, having conceded that my preconceived notions of how it should play out, uh, I think were wrong. Yeah, well, it's definitely a good enough movie that you could watch it again and probably enjoy it. Just a few words about the opening of The Exorcist. Uh... We start with sun over the desert, heat rising, people digging in northern Iraq, uh, an archaeological dig, I assume. And uh, a lot of stuff happens in this opening sequence, and it's uh, it's all kind of weird, and it's kind of unnerving in a way. There's dogs fighting, there's rocks falling, men with guns. I feel like this opening sequence is all it's meant to make us feel kind of like, what's going on, you know, and where are we? And, and, and there's just something a little disturbing about it and we we meet uh an older man played by max von sudo uh and uh, he he turns out to be father Marin, who we will come to know later in the movie but we don't really know anything about him at this point and uh at one point he says that he has to do something and he goes and he looks at this very evil looking statue that they must have unearthed in this archaeological dig and uh I don't really know what it means, but sand blows, the bright red sun burns, and we dissolve to Georgetown, USA. So uh, did you have any thoughts about this opening sequence? I do. Um, so first, let me go off on a tangent. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to stick to the story. We already did All our right. tangents. Uh, so I thought this was interesting, especially, you know, your first time watching it, you may be like, oh, maybe this is about this character. Maybe we're going to be in the Middle East. And then we just cut away and we don't revisit this character till he comes back at the end. So it was interesting storytelling in that you're introducing this character who's going to come way at the end of the movie. And you're introducing the relationship with him and this demon. And also you're, you know, you're setting up the whole heart condition. So this, and it, also it's very little dialogue too, which works because obviously, you know, you're in the Middle East, a lot of people aren't going to be speaking English anyway. So there's a lot here that's just all set up for something that comes all the way at the end. And uh, it, this movie as a whole is interesting because who's the main character? Generally you start off your film with your main character. The first five, 10 minutes is dedicated to setting up your main character. And he's, this sets it up. He is the exorcist in the title, The Exorcist. So in a way, he's the main character. But in a way, the other priest is the main character. In a way, Reagan's the main character. And in a way, like, there's so many people that potentially are the main characters. And then eventually, when we get to the end of the movie, it's like, wait a minute, the movie ends with none of these people who we thought were the main character. So it's just, it's in a strange ensemble film that works. But this is part of where that whole ensembleness starts with with this and the other thing i take away from this is max van Sydow, man the second time we covered him we also did the seventh seal and i think as we go along with the no rules film school podcast we're gonna 
and also rewind, which is also part of this section that we're doing here, your section. <laughs> we're going to come into more actors and performances like this, and it's going to make me reevaluate my ladder of favorite actors or greatest actors because, like, there's so many great actors. But how do you define to you who's a great actor? You know, you can go by like, okay. Who's in all the blockbusters that I love to watch? I mean, I love the Avengers. So, oh man, they're like Iron Man is so great. Like Robert Downey, he's the greatest actor of all time. Or you know, you know Tom Cruise, he's in all these. You know, or or Cary Grant, he's, he's in all these old classic films. Or for me, it's like James Cagney has all this energy. But to me, the more we do these films, I and mean, the more we examine films, the more actors like Max von Sydow or another film we did, um, Rashomon, to Shur Mifune. The more these type of actors to me are going to rise on my list, the actors that have the nuances in their performances and also have the fortitude and the the willingness to be picky with their projects and star in these films that are great and that their nuanced performance elevated. So Ben Saito stuck out to me and the formatting of how the story is going to be told stuck out to me. Indeed. And uh, so we do wind up in Georgetown, USA. And uh, in a way, it feels like this is where the movie starts, you know, because we're introduced to a few characters here. Um, we're introduced to a mom and a daughter, uh, Chris McNeil, who's a successful actress. And she seems to have a bunch of employees working for her and her daughter, Reagan. And uh, they seem to have a very good relationship. They seem to get along. There's also a father who's kind of absent and uh, Chris is kind of angry at him for not being present, even for the daughter's birthday. Uh, so there's clearly something going on there. Um, at the same time, we meet the priest who's taking care of his elderly mother, and that is Father Karras, Damien Karras. And so we're kind of introduced to these two different storylines that are running parallel. Um, and uh, there's a few interesting things that kind of pop up in here, like, uh, Chris thinks that she hears rats in the attic, but everybody says, no, that's impossible. And later she finds Reagan is uh, uh, using a Ouija board. And, and there's the suggestion that there's something kind of sinister going on there. And I remember the first time I saw this movie, I was trying to relate that opening sequence to this. And, you know, where they find this little tiny statue that looks evil, as well as that giant big statue that looks evil. And when she talks about rats in the attic, I was waiting to find out, okay, is there, is there something up in the attic that maybe got shipped there from Iraq, you know, but I don't think there is. I don't think there's any connection there. I don't think we find that out. But um, anyway, so this, this kind of opening sequence, we really meet all these characters. And, uh, and Father Karras, we learn that he is kind of, you know, he's at a crisis point. He wants to move to new york to be close to his mother who's ailing and he also kind of wants to get out of his job he feels that he's unfit he's a he's a psychiatrist for the church and he feels like he's lost his faith so that is a key theme that i think we're going to see running through this movie um do you have anything to say about uh, any of this no, I mean, the story's coming along well, um, establishing different characters. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. We, we get introduced to the uh, some of the other main characters that we're going to be following the film. Yeah. So um, I mentioned a couple of the weird things that happen. And, uh, you know, again, there's the rats in the attic. And there were traps set out, but, you know, Chris goes up and looks. There's the, no rats in the traps traps are untouched um and meanwhile uh i'm sorry there, there's one thing i'll mention since you mentioned the, the rats in the attic thing sure that was the first jump scare and i remember mm -hmm. reading how he took all the jump scares out the film i'm like why do you leave that one in <laughs> you know it's just like <laughs> well i'm like of all the jump scares yeah. to leave in the film is like because yeah. when she's in the attic and the guy walks up behind her it's like yeah, eh, that's a cheap jump scare you find in any like typical like movie and he emphasized William Freakin how he took all these things out of the film and he chose to keep that one in there that that one kind of yeah. stuck out because that's the only time yeah. it's like oh by the way this is a horror movie you know so I just thought <laughs> that scene was kind of weird yeah that's interesting I haven't thought of that but um, I guess they felt they had to have one 
Um, but you know, aside from the rats and and the Ouija board, uh, there's a scene where. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You, yes? you, you keep mentioning things now. Did you mention the Ouija board and the rats before? I, I did. I mentioned the Ouija board and the rats. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. I wasn't paying attention. I was just. <laughs> I had to type out an email for work, so I I, I lost my concentration for a second. Uh -huh. so I was like. Uh, no, okay. I don't have anything to say. <laughs> I'm right. sorry. I did want to mention something about the Ouija board. So sure. William Friedkin, I, I, his interviews, man, they got to they got to be listened and, and studied. But he did this interview. He was so degrading <laughs> towards the lead actress <laughs> in this movie. He was like, "When I was casting this movie, he sounds like Donald Trump when you listen to his interviews. <laughs> when I was casting this movie, I wanted." I didn't want someone the studio wanted for the lead. They wanted Farrah Fawcett and all these other women. I wanted someone as plain as an old shopping cart. And he was like, <laughs> this was the lead actress I needed for my film. Then they sent me to New York to meet up with this girl or this actress. I'm not going to say her name. I bump into her in the grocery store and she looks so awful. I who's the who's the girl he ended up casting in this film? What's her name? Um, Ellen Burstyn. Ellen Burstyn. He's like, I called up Ellen. I said the part's yours. I, she, and Ellen was like, oh, the part's mine. I thought you were going to New York to meet up with someone. I met her in a grocery store, and she looks so plain. There's no way I'm casting her. Ellen was like, Well, I could have looked plain. Well, I didn't see you, so tough luck for her. So, and the reason I bring this up is because. When they're doing the Ouija board scene, uh, Reagan is like, uh, is my mom pretty? And then the Ouija board doesn't move. So I'm like, <laughs> is that him taking a shot as the lead actress? <laughs> so, uh, Maybe. I don't know. When, when I saw yeah. that scene, it reminded me of, of the interview I heard. And it, I don't know, I thought it was a funny little thing to, to throw in there. So. Yeah, no, that's that's funny. I hadn't heard that. But uh, yeah, the Ouija board. There is something going on there. When the when the mother tries to participate, it moves on its own, and she blames Reagan for that. And Reagan, of course, didn't do it. She says it's Captain Howdy. Yeah, Captain reminds Howdy. me of The Shining, like with like you know, yeah, you know, with yeah. Doc, you know. So yeah, yeah. And many years later, Witchboard will kind of deal with the same thing. But um, well, not even the yeah. witchboard, but the fact that uh, Captain Howdy is the demon, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 So For it's sure. like the demon is introduced to her, and she's thinking it's before it actually possesses her. It's kind. Of, she yes. thinks it's kind of her friend. So. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And um, so, meanwhile, at the church, uh, they discover that the church has been desecrated there's a statue with blood all over it there's something happened there um and uh so there are these weird little sort of possibly supernatural or at least strange things going on and uh you know you could kind of look at any one of them as a possible starting point like using the ouija board is she stirring up the evil spirits by doing that but wait a minute the rats were already in the attic you know and this thing that happens at the church and it's like uh, you know, and then what about Iraq, you know, where the, with the, the scary statues, you know, and so it's hard to know what the entry point is here of the evil. But in any case, um, Father Karras's mother winds up dying and uh, he's very disturbed by this. He, he feels he should have been there. He's feeling guilty. He has nightmares about it. And around the same time, Reagan's behavior really starts going sideways. You know, she sort of pretends to be asleep when her mother's talking to her. And they have a really good relationship, as we've seen earlier in the movie. But then she opens her eyes when her mom leaves. And, and the one scene that I remember really disturbing me when I was young was when her mother's having this big party and she's up in bed sleeping and she comes down all of a sudden and she says to this astronaut, you're going to die up there. And then she pees on the floor. And I don't know why, but that moment just really stuck with me when I was 12. It's like, oh, this is just like really disturbing. Um, and very shortly after that, uh, Reagan, uh, she had commented to her mom earlier that she couldn't sleep because her bed was shaking, which just seems a bit odd, you know, and her mom doesn't take it very seriously. But then in this moment, 
after her mom puts her to bed, she hears Ray, Reagan screaming and she runs back in and she sees the entire bed sh shaking, you know? So this is a moment where, uh, as we were talking about, they're kind of revealing to you that this is real, you know, like something's really going on here. You know, like we, we've had a few weird things happen, but we're seeing the bed moving, you know? <laughs> uh, there's pretty much no way that that could just be happening. You know, it's not like a truck driving by the house and shaking the house. This is like a, a serious thing. So, um, anyway, do you have any thoughts about any of this stuff? Yeah, this is, again, I said, you know, until we actually see the supernatural stuff happening, how I wish they would have leaned more into the ambiguity of it. She's claiming her bed is shaken. Like, we don't really, like, see the supernatural stuff with the bed shaking. And then she also pees herself and says, you're going to die. And it's like, all of that stuff is like, man, it's like, it's really ambiguous, like ambiguous, yeah. Am ambiguous, Am Am ambiguous. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave that in there. Um, yeah, <laughs> it's really ambiguous. It's like, OK, it, is this happening? Is this not happening? And I was wishing it would lean more into that. But as we already established before in the other section, we recorded that I, I do agree eventually where they went with this. But this was before the supernatural stuff started happening. I like the ambiguity of everything going on. Yeah, I did too. Um, but I also found it very interesting and kind of refreshing in a way that the mother sees it happening, you know, because as you've mentioned previously, often a character says, hey, this stuff's happening. And then every time another character comes in to see it, it's not happening anymore, right? And so they think this person's crazy. And so you kind of expect that's what's going to happen. But but no, they let the mom see this. And so the mom is kind of brought in to the, the reality that, yeah, something supernatural is going so on. So the mother saw the bed shaking at this point? I thought that happened yes. later in the film. Oh. No, it's uh, it's right here, yeah. After okay. after the, after the she gives her a bath, after the party and the peeing incidents, and then she puts her to bed, and then, boom, she starts screaming in the bed. And, uh, yeah. Okay, this happened she... after the peeing stuff. After the peeing, yes. Okay, yeah, I'm saying yes. yeah, everything before the peeing. Yeah, the peeing and yes. before. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. And yeah, the, the bed shaking, this is where her, her neck blew up like a frog, right? Um, I think so. I'm not 100% yeah. sure. But yeah, there was yeah. there was a point where the bed was shaking, she floated up, and then her yeah. neck was pulsating. Yeah, yeah. 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 I think that was yeah. a 53 minute mark, I think. That sounds about right. Yeah. 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 So then we start a new section of the movie at this point, which um, I like to call what is possibly the scathing indictment of the medical profession. Uh, this is the first time I saw the movie. I don't think it really struck me, but when I saw the movie again, when I was a little bit older, I was really struck by this section of the movie where uh, the mom takes Reagan to various doctors to try and figure out what's going on and it's just a nightmare you know like the doctors are all running these tests on her and the tests are horrible right they're terrible they're they're frightening they're 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 more disturbing in a way than the actual problem and and they're trying to diagnose her but they're they're failing you know they're coming up with all these false ideas and um you know, this is something that has only become more resonant with me over the years as I've had to deal with aging parents going into the hospital, and dealing with that kind of tunnel vision where doctors or nurses kind of get this idea and it's like, this is what's wrong. And yet they can't find any evidence of it, which is what's happening here. And uh, yeah, I just find this section of the film, again, we're back to realism in a way because it's it's all real world stuff, but it's kind of disturbing and it's kind of scary. And, and poor Reagan is like really kind of disturbed by a lot of it. Um, so, yeah, it's yeah, this section of the movie I find very interesting. And uh, they finally send her to see a psychiatrist. Um, and when he tries to talk to her, she winds up assaulting him physically which is a nice, interesting moment as well. Um, so do you have any thoughts about this uh, medical section of the movie? Is this the part where they pierced her neck with the and the blood started squishing out? Yes, that's yeah, one of the that... many things. 
uh, that and the P thing were like two of the most yeah. like realistic <laughs> things that kind of freak me the fuck out. It's like, yes it's nothing supernatural about it but just like seeing it was just so like cringy it's like oh my god i had to look away yeah that's what i mean it's like it's a nightmarish sequence and then they've got her in that one machine that's spinning around her it looks like some weird sci-fi thing and she's kind of being tortured by it in a way it's yeah. it's a very disturbing sequence yeah um so meanwhile um her mom, Chris, comes home and makes a horrifying discovery that her director and her friend, Burke, is dead. He's died in a horrible accident, and he was supposed to be looking after Reagan. He was in the house, but they find him dead at the bottom of the concrete stairs just outside of the house. And um, <clears throat> it seems to me that the implication is that perhaps Reagan has somehow done this to him, you know, because we've seen her physically attack the, the psychiatrist and she was very strong. And so the suggestion that he was supposed to be taking care of her and then he's dead at the bottom of the stairs, I feel like they're dropping a hint here that this might be, this might be what has happened. And that's kind of a horrifying thought. Um, and then a detective winds up showing up investigating and he sort of goes down that path as well. Like he's trying to figure out what happened here and i again i feel like there's definitely the suggestion that maybe reagan may have killed this guy you know um do you have any thoughts about that yeah so this is um one of my one of i mean there's a lot when you say you have a favorite character actor there's so many great character actors but this is a, a really good character actor um he was in a lot of the um lee j cobb who plays mm -hmm. this detective character he was in a lot of those early um, films with the method actors. I think he was like in On the Waterfront, mm. um, 12 Angry Men, stuff like that. But I really remember him from On the Waterfront uh, and a few other films that he played like, you know, bit parts in, which he kind of does here. But he's a really good character. I think he was in like... Yeah. Anyway, a few other films that, that were really good. He's one of those faces that you see in the background. It's like, oh, yeah, I remember him. He's a good actor in a few other projects. Mm -hmm. But his character was supposed to have a spinoff series. And evidently, it was stolen or there was a very similar project out at the time. Uh, Columbo. Oh, wow. And it was this actor. It was a, a, a trench coat wearing detective who pretend to have Alzheimer's and he'd meet up with these people and whatever people watching a lot of people watching it's like Columbo what the, who, who's that all this build up for Colum <laughs> who's Columbo <laughs> but Columbo is like an old old detective show where you know there'd be like a different person every week and the guest star is always the killer at the end of the show and uh but the main character basically was the this de this detective it was a prototype for it you know it, mm absent-minded you know detective wearing this raincoat that would come in and ask these innocuous questions and and solve the mystery at the end and uh yeah that's the first thing i thought of is i remember hearing the backstory of that and uh and and yeah there's a really good actor and again he brings another uh another perspective to the film you know uh, in this big ensemble cast and we end up following his character towards the end, which again adds more dynamics to who are we following in this movie? Whose story are we being told here? Yeah, and uh, you're right. He is great. He's a great actor, great character. I did not know about the Columbo thing, but now that you say it, yeah, I can totally see how he's a similar character because he certainly has this style where he comes in and he kind of suggests things without really suggesting it, you know, and kind of saying, ah, you know, how can it be? You know, and he's sort of he's like the guy you don't see coming you know he's he's kind of putting it together but he's not overtly uh doing anything it seems yeah. um so uh right after the detective leaves after talking to uh chris uh one of the most notorious scenes in the movie occurs uh, this is the let jesus fuck you scene uh where reagan is I guess masturbating with a crucifix and there's blood 
and she grabs onto her mother and pulls her face down into her bloody crotch and says, lick me. <laughs> and uh, obviously a very disturbing scene um, to a 12 year old, but certainly anyone really, <laughs> I think would find this disturbing. And this moment I believe is kind of the last straw for a desperate mother. You know, when this happens, I think this is kind of like it, this is the turning point. Um, but that's, to me, that's one of the iconic scenes which has been parodied and talked about. So, do you have anything to say about that? A lot to say about this. Yeah. So, <laughs> I know this is going to disturb you because you love this film, but Paranormal <laughs> Activity. Can we talk about Paranormal <laughs> Activity? Absolutely. So, Paranormal Activity is another, again, super subtle supernatural film, or whatever. And, you know, they they borrow heavily from this, this film as well. And part of what made Paramount Activity a huge hit is that it was a movie that was picked up by a studio at a time where a lot of projects were being transferred there and there wasn't a lot of release dates available. So the whole promotional team had a lot of time and they had nothing to promote. So they spent a lot of time promoting this little low budget shot on video film. And what they did was, I guess they were watching a lot of old movies when they were promoting this because they saw The Exorcist, like, oh, this promotion's great. Because what made, the, a big part of what made The Exorcist so successful is its promotional campaign. And a lot of the footage of like, it would just be people leaving the theater saying, oh my God, this movie is so scary and people fainting. And you know, it was just this whole thing of like, don't watch this movie. It's the church doesn't want you to watch it. No one wants you to watch it. It's too scary. Don't watch this movie. And just like audience reactions, leaving screenings and things like that. And basically Paranormal Activity took that whole promotional campaign from The Exorcist uh, for this movie. And I do agree. Uh, I mean, it's a great movie. That's why it was successful. It stood the test of time. It's historically important. It had one of the best marketing campaigns you can have, and it was even reused later on. I think it should it should have been reused even more because what better way to, to promote a horror movie by saying, don't watch this horror movie, it's too scary. <laughs> um, but with all that said, with all of that said, everything this movie has going for it, honestly, the reason this movie became popular and the reason this movie made so much money is because you have a little girl cursing and saying a lot of <laughs> fucked up shit and then fucking herself with a Jesus cross. Let's be honest. A lot of people went to this movie because they're like, they saw clips of this girl, little girl cursing and they're like, I gotta see this shit. And that's one of the more popular scenes in the movie, you know? Yeah. Um, so when you boil down to it, sometimes it's just simple stuff like that. It's kind of like the Barbenheimer thing. Is the Barbie movie good? Did they spend a ton of money advertising it with all these innovative things? And they spent years planning out how this is going to be the summer of Barbie. Was Oppenheimer good? Yeah, of course. But you know what? I, 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 the Mission Impossible was also good. Dead Reckoning. I think it was better than both of those movies. And it's a great movie. But it made no money. And those movies made money because there was the whole Barbenheimer thing. And sometimes it has nothing to do with your movie, nothing to do with the advertising campaign, but just something happens that make people say, I gotta watch this movie. And suddenly Barbenheimer became a thing and everyone wanted to see both of those movies and no one saw Mission Impossible that came out the week before, but yet they're all great movies. And again, this movie, ton of great advertising, great movie, but you know what? This little girl fucking herself with the Jesus cross <laughs> and cursing and a lot of people had to see this movie and I just had to get that rant out of the way. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I understand, you know, and I think that you're right. Like, it's like having a really amazing gore shot in the middle of your movie and everybody goes, oh, my God, you've got to see this gore shot. You know, and I think it is a bit like that. It's so offensive. It's so shocking. It's so outrageous, particularly for the time. Um, yeah, people just had to see that. And, and I get it. I totally get it. Um, and that kind of takes us to the next section of the movie, which I would describe as Father Karras kind of investigating the situation skeptically because Chris goes and talks to him and she asks, how do I get an exorcism? And, uh, you know, the suggestion has been made by the psychiatrists or, or the doctors, you know, that, well, you could do an exorcism. I mean, of course it's bullshit. We don't believe in that. It's not that, but sometimes, you know, 
for psychological reasons, if you do an exorcism, you might be able to convince the patient that they're cured. Um, but she's now taking it to the next level and actually talking to a priest and saying, you know, how do I get an exorcism? And he's basically like, oh, you know, it's impossible. Nobody does it. And he can't really believe that it's necessary, you know, and he agrees to see Reagan and, and uh, you know, he's clearly disturbed by what he sees and he tries challenging this, well, I don't know what to call it, this entity or whatever is inside Reagan. He tries to challenge it with questions and making suggestions and basically the demon or whatever it is doesn't really cooperate and then we have the famous pea soup moment where uh, he is uh, puked on and I think Karis is clearly moved by all of this and he feels that clearly there's you know something going on here but he says he can't do an exorcism, exorcism and the church won't accept any of this as evidence you know she needs to speak a language that she doesn't speak um, but meanwhile uh, Reagan had spoken to him about his dead mother and so he asks Chris well you know did she know about that like huh? no of course she didn't know about that you know? and so I you know again this is kind of probably weighing on his mind that there's something real going on here um, but uh, we get the holy water trick where he throws water on Reagan and Reagan reacts as if it's really painful but then he says later that it's not holy water so it was a trick and uh, reagan or somebody is pretending that it's you know hurting them when it shouldn't be hurting them um so again it's all this kind of he's running tests but he's not getting any satisfaction he's trying to speak foreign languages and he's not really getting the answers he wants uh but then reagan does seem to speak a very strange language and he records it and then he plays the tape for an expert and the expert says well that's english and he reverses the tape and basically she was speaking english backwards <laughs> and uh perhaps the last straw of this section is when father Karras is called to the house by a servant who shows him that on reagan's skin the words help me are, are kind of coming out of her coming sort of forming in her skin and so i think this is the point where he's just decides he's got to do something even though he can't really believe this is truly demonic possession he's got to do something um do you have anything to say about this section yeah was this the section when the demon first started speaking as his mother yes okay yes. yeah so this is like the demon playing psychological warfare and you got to wonder like this demon is so i mean the demon being sadistic or redundant, right? <laughs> <laughs> but not only is it torturing this little girl physically, but he's tor torturing this priest mentally, you know, bringing mm -hmm. up the mother, even like bringing up the, the, I think earlier in the film, he saw some bum in the, in the subway that said something to him. And then the demon repeated it. So mm -hmm. part of it is like, is this demon playing psychological warfare with the priest or is it just his own guilt and his own psychosis that's thinking that the demon is bringing these things up? Because even though it's a demon, how would the demon know any of that stuff? Because even he, as he's leaving, asks the mother, like, did you know this? You know, did I mention this to you, like, about my mother dying and stuff? So, like, even though it's a demon, like, how would the demon know any of those things? So, it not only is the demon, like, sadistic, but also you have to wonder about the mental state of or one of our, if not our lead character, like, is he even mentally prepared to, you know, combat this thing? Because he's kind of losing his mind as well, where, like, maybe he's embellishing the things that the demon's even doing. Kind of like the unreliable, you know, lead character type thing, so. Yeah. Well, he's losing his mind, and he's already told us he's lost his faith, you know, so he doesn't really believe in this stuff. But he goes and he meets with his superiors at the church to try and get permission to do an exorcism because he figures, well, you know, why, why not? And, uh, and they ask him, do you think this is real? Do you think this is a real possession? And he basically says, no, but he thinks it meets the requirements at this point. So even now, even witnessing all the things he's witnessed, he still thinks, no, this isn't real, but he's willing to try it. 
And uh, what I find really interesting about this is that this meeting with the church goes much better than you would think, you know, because you kind of think the church is going to say, no, no, this is bullshit. You can't do it. Um, you kind of expect them to be unreasonable, but instead they're like very reasonable and they suggest Father Marin could come and help him. And this is where we finally hear about Father Marin, who we kind of met in that opening sequence. Uh, and he's apparently an experienced exorcist who's been through this before and it almost killed him. So um, I find that very interesting that uh, the church kind of, they wind up being very reasonable in this moment. And uh, so then Father Marin and Father Karras kind of join forces. And when Father Marin shows up in front of the house, we get one of the most iconic shots in horror history, perhaps maybe cinema history, the shot of him standing in front of the house and looking up at it. It's an iconic shot. If I would thought of it, I would have worn a t-shirt that I have, which has this shot on it. <laughs> it's such an iconic shot and a great sort of introduction to the character, although we did meet him earlier in the movie. Um, do you have anything to say at this point? Cinema has a lot of great intro shots or iconic shots, but this character setup shots. I remember Stagecoach had this beautiful shot of a zoom in on a young John Wayne. And there's a lot of movies where they build up a character and they build up the character and they build up the character and that character comes on screen and it's just a beautiful shot. And I think, you know, having it being introduced to this character in the Middle East before, and then, you know, you saw him, you saw what he's, he, you saw some of the things he did, then you hear the build up of him. And then, like you said, then to come in, it, I think it had like three or four iconic shots in a row. First, you had the shot of him outside the house, which again, it's just, it's the poster. And then you have the shot where she opens the door and he's still, his face is still shadowed. You have the shot of Reagan half, half in shadow as he's approaching and you see her close up. And it's just like, man, like, whew. What was in the water that day when they were coming up with that shot list you know it was yeah. just like three or four like shot shot boom 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 like just a great shot composition for a few shots in a row that was just like yeah that's how you introduce somebody yeah for sure and i have to say i love it when uh father Marin comes in and he starts doing his thing and he's basically telling father karis what to do and what not to do and he has no patience for anything and father Karis keeps trying to tell him about the history of the case, you know, let me tell you about it. He's like, no, I don't need to hear any of that. We just need to proceed. We need to go forward with this. And, uh, and they basically do. They just begin the ritual. And it gets really intense. And, uh, you know, this is probably arguably the most intense section of the movie where they kind of uh, do battle with the evil spirit. And we see the bed levitating and and, uh, you know, and this is a point where I think to myself, okay, Father Karras, who's lost his faith, he's now seeing the bed levitate and he's seeing all this stuff like, like this must be helping, right? This must be bringing his faith back to him. I mean, he's witnessing some stuff here that's pretty, pretty intense. Um, and so, of course, uh, uh, Reagan goes after Karras with talks of his mother again. And... Um, both priests wind up getting knocked down to the floor at one point. And, um, and then I, there's a shot where Reagan is like, it seems like she's kneeling on the bed and she's gesturing wildly to some unseen God. And then if I'm not mistaken, it looks to me like that statue from the beginning of the movie, the evil statue from the Iraq desert appears sort of before her in some sort of vision. Uh, I have no idea what this means. I've, is, is this the connection? Uh, it's all very strange, um, but it's 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 intense. And uh, and then Reagan seems to fall into a slumber, and Father Marin suggests they take a break before they start again. And so they leave, and we take a break. And so, any thoughts on this first? section of battle yeah yeah i mean it, it, this is this is why you go into the movie right you don't go into a movie the exorcist for you know for you know a shootout or you know or a comedy or you know stand-up routine you're going for the exorcist and this is the exorcism you know 
and the exorcist is there this is the exorcism and this is you know this is a, a really good scene a lot of not a lot of iconic shots and you have the iconic i mean this film is filled with iconic shots but it only has one real iconic line and that's the power of christ compels you the power <laughs> of christ compels yes. you and this is yes. this is where you have that iconic line so i loved it i loved it and um i even loved that they took a break you know because mm -hmm. it fits the tone of the film it's like you don't want like 30 minutes of like non-stop like sensory overload you know it's like mm -hmm. they came in you saw a lot of good shit, and then they went and regrouped so i kind of like the pacing of it as well yeah for sure it's uh, incredibly intense and effective and when they take the break yeah it's kind of like we need it as much as they do so that's great and father Marin goes into the bathroom and he takes the heart medication which we saw him doing at the beginning and uh so that's tying in there and uh father Karras goes back into reagan's room and he sees a vision of his mother again and he hears her voice and he winds up getting very upset and uh, father Marin comes back in and basically tells him to leave you know you are too affected here you have to leave so uh while father Marin is alone with reagan father Karras goes downstairs and talks to the mother chris and uh chris asks her is reagan going to die and he says no and i feel like this is a moment for him where he kind of strengthens his resolve and he realizes he's got to pull himself together and and do right here so he he heads back upstairs and uh the doorbell rings at this point and it's actually the detective showing up um but now we move into what is uh, perhaps the final climactic sequence here, um, which maybe we could call Father Karras finishes it. Um, he enters the room and he finds that Father Marin is dead on the floor. And he tries to revive Father Marin, but it's, it's no good. And I just want to note here that this is very interesting because uh, this is an example where the movie kind of leaves out something that you think would be in there because we don't see what happens to Father Marin. He goes into the room and then the next time we see him, he's dead. So we have to use our imagination in terms of what happened in there. Um, so I find that very interesting and it's, uh, it's strangely effective as well. And so uh, Reagan starts to laugh at Father Karras. And this sends Karras into a rage. And he starts punching Reagan. And he says, take me, come into me. And suddenly, it seems like he becomes possessed. And he's moving towards Reagan as if he might kill her. But then Karras kind of gets control again, long enough to hurl himself out the window and presumably repeat the horrible death of Burke, which we heard about as he hits that long stone staircase and goes down the stairs, probably breaks every bone in his body. And the detective is there to witness this, witness the aftermath at least, and, and you know, is obviously quite stunned by it. Um, and Father Dyer, who is uh, Father Karras' friend, who we've seen periodically throughout the film, um, he gives Father Karras the last rites, and amazingly, Karras is still alive even after that huge fall, and he's squeezing uh, Father Dyer's hand, and I feel like this is the moment that kind of tells us that his faith has returned. He's, he's, he's getting the last rites, he's accepting the last rites, he's doing what he needs to do, so he is now back within the glory of heaven or whatever um he is now cured of his lack of faith by this horrible thing that happens um and that's uh that's sort of the bulk of the main part and then after that is an epilogue but before we get there uh what are your thoughts on this section so a lot happens here um you have another quiet moment in the middle of the exorcist where he's downstairs uh father Karras with the, the mother and they're having a quiet moment and upstairs you know we have you know 
Max von Sydow, our main exorcist, dies off screen. So both characters that Reagan kills, she kills them both off screen. I thought it was interesting to kill off like your your big, you know, your big gun, you know, off screen, especially the first time I saw it, I was like, whoa, like what happened there? Is he sleeping? <laughs> <laughs> Is yes. it past the old guy's bedtime? <laughs> you know? <so. laughs> uh, yes. Yeah, so I thought it was interesting to have him him die off screen and it, it opens the, the, the way for Karis to play hero. But just the way he bursts in that room and she's just like holding on to the bed post, giggling like a little girl who did something naughty. And yeah. you know, you have, so it, it was kind of like, it was kind of like a play between, cause you kind of had the demon and you had the little girl. That was kind of like a hybrid of, she's acting like a the little girl who did something wrong, naughty, but it's still the demon, you know? Mm -hmm. You didn't have that like mix, you know, of, of the two. It almost seemed like a demonic little girl instead of a girl possessed by a demon. So I thought yes. that whole scene played off pretty interestingly. And uh, this was something that they were worried about, you know, the, the producers and the director, is in your climax, you have this man beating up a little girl. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. But they were saying, like, yeah. if they did their job correctly, they'd know that they were just, he was just beating up the demon, not the little girl. But it's all... Yes. It's, you can't help but chuckle a little bit at the visual of like the big climax of one of the greatest horror movies ever made is a grown man beating up like a, a little girl. So um, yes. that was that was kind of hilarious. And obviously he plays the ultimate sacrifice by, you know, um, by taking the demon into himself and then, and then sacrificing himself at the end. Yes. And you have to think, man, like a lot of people died for this girl to 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 mm. survive a lot of sacrifices were made um yes. for her for her to um to make it through all this so yes but yeah uh definitely a, a worthy climax yes for beating up beating up kids I'm, I'm, all, I'm all for it i'm all for it yes oh well again it's like such a unique moment you know watching and they've set it up perfectly because he's a boxer right we've seen him training throughout the film he's punching the bag you know when his mother dies he's punching the bag in frustration and and so he's he's ready to punch this little girl hard you know he's really he's he's not gonna yeah this is not a, a gentle beating i think this is a serious I, i'm surprised uh, <laughs> like some TikToker hasn't made like a TikTok of him practicing in the in the in boxing with like rocky music and then at the end he beats up the little girl yeah yeah and uh you know uh, i'm just remembering one of my friends uh the first time he saw the exorcist um his comment was that the the ending is very sudden and i was like what are you talking about man you know but then the next time i watched the movie i i could see what he means because in a way you've got this big epic battle between the two priests and the demon and then they take a break and then we go back in and it's really very fast it's just like grab the girl punch her demon into him and he's out the window like it's a very quick ending in a lot of ways it's they don't drag it out and um I don't think it's a problem personally i'd never noticed it really but it is uh they, they waste no time here and um i think uh the thing about father Marin dying off screen i think in a way they couldn't have done it any better if they had shown the death i don't think it would be as effective i think there is something to the idea that we walk in and he's dead and that in itself is a shock you know Although they've set it up because they, we've seen him taking the heart medication more than once. So we know that there is a risk there. And I think it's probably more effective that they didn't have some big battle scene between him and the demon and the demon kills him or something. I, 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 yeah, I think I think it works really well as it is. It also leaves it open as to did the demon kill him or did his heart fail? Exactly, yeah. And I always assume that his heart gave out uh, perhaps in the midst of some kind of struggle, but yeah, I don't, I don't think of it as like Reagan choking him to death or anything like that. I think it was probably his heart, but it could be that you know she did something that you know really scared him or whatever and caused the the heart attack. But we'll never know for sure. So uh, moving along. We have the epilogue, 
And um, it's some time later, and Reagan and her mom are packing up to leave, and they say their goodbyes, and uh, Father Dyer comes by to say goodbye. And they kind of talk about the fact that Reagan doesn't remember any of this. She doesn't remember her ordeal at all. And they think that's a good idea. Um, and then uh, she, there's an interesting moment where she sees his collar and she's sort of moved to kiss him. And so presumably subconsciously, she's recognizing the fact that she's grateful to the priests who saved her from this evil. So even though she doesn't remember it, I think she has some instinct there. And then they drive off. And Father Dyer looks down the long stone staircase pensively. And this is where, as a 12-year-old, I was like, oh, I got to get out of here. You know, I cannot stay. Because if that demon comes back and attacks Father Dyer, I'm going to be very upset here. Uh, but it doesn't happen. He just looks down the stairs, presumably remembering everything. And we fade to, bat, fade to black. And so there's no cheap ending to this movie. They don't put in a cheap jump scare at the end. They don't do anything like that. They just end the story in its logical way. And I like that. Um, any thoughts? Yeah, it further makes me think that they ripped off Columbo because this is how a lot of the Col Columbo episodes would end. <laughs> you know, he'd come in at the end and, you know, he'd speak to everyone and hey, do you want to go out and get, get something to eat or get, watch a movie? He's like, no, all right, let's get something to eat. It, it just feels very Columbo-esque, the ending, you know? Um, also, what's interesting, too, is uh, the father we, that we do end with, the, the, you know, the least prominent of the fathers that we follow, Father Dyer, um, in that scene where he's reading him his last rites, where she's desperately trying to do, because I, I guess I think that's when he went to heaven or something like that. Um, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not religious. I'm not sure how that stuff works, but I think he needed to read it to him, you know? Yes. Um, but it, in that scene, um, Freakin was getting frustrated. He wasn't getting the performance he wanted. And I think he's really? like, hey, you trust me? He was like, yeah, I trust you. You sure you trust me, right? Smacked the shit out of him and said, go ahead and shoot the scene. So the scene where he's like, that close up where he's like begging for his last rites. Freaking had just smacked him across the face to get like his <laughs> eyes to tear up and to get that like raw motion from him. So wow. um, just one of several stories um, from Freaking that, you know, I, I, I heard of as I was doing this stuff. And you know what? I, I can't wait to do Chinatown at some point because that's his other great <laughs> movie that I'd like to get into. I can't imagine what that would a terror he was on set there. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I definitely admire him as a director, you know, because the lengths he went to to get this film done the way he wanted it done. And the film went through a lot of directors. I mean, a lot of Stanley Kubrick, they tried to get him to do it. They tried to get a lot of other prominent directors to do it. And they either turned it down or weren't available. And um, the writer really wanted uh, Freakin because of some meeting he had where it felt the project fell through but he was he admired the fact that he was so passionate to get things done on his terms that he thought like yeah this is the guy that i want doing my film doing my movie um uh blatley the writer so uh yeah, yeah i think this was a great choice especially when you hear about the changes that freaking made to the script that blatley wrote i think all the changes helped it you know or otherwise yeah. you would have ended up with a pretty standard horror film and yeah. i gotta say man the, the i came out of this i i love i like van saito even more um i i love freaking because mm -hmm. just like it, the audacity to say like yeah this this has to be something better than the omen or rosemary's <laughs> baby i wanted something the fact that he his standard <laughs> is Movies that we yeah. consider great, like, you know, this has to be better than that. Talking about yeah. these movies, like they're like run of the mill horror movies, but <laughs> you got to admire him. Mean, he made movies up until I think the year he died, which was earlier this year he died. Um, yeah. I know he made a lot of, I know he made a movie with um, Matthew McConaughey that was really good as well a few years ago. So uh, he was making good movies for a while. I mean, th these were his two standouts and probably the only two yeah. that would fit the criteria of what we're looking to cover. But yeah, uh, definitely came out of this uh, admiring him as well. 
Yeah, he definitely had an interesting career, and uh, I think it was a bit hit and miss in terms of you know some of the movies were great, some of them were not as great, some of them were big hits, some of them were flops, but um, he certainly made his share of good movies, and uh, most of them are worth watching. Uh, I think uh, one that people are kind of excited about is Sorcerer, um, mm. which is about a truck driver or a convoy of trucks moving. I believe nitroglycerin through very difficult roads and it's a suspense film and i think he made that, that film if i remember correctly i think he made it the same year as star wars and uh kind of thought that it would be a big success but of course it was completely ignored and star wars became a big success but um but i think it's a pretty great movie uh, worth yeah seeing. i haven't seen it but i i mean i i definitely would be interested in watching it now that i've seen more you know i've examined his work even though i'd already seen this movie a few times looking at it you know the way we look at it for the film room podcast you know school yeah. rules film school podcast um the only reason i i would say the only film that really re meets our criteria is uh the french connection is because if we were to visit sorcerer um there was another film that was kind of it was either based on or based on the same material of the wages yeah. of fear from 1953 which is yes. a film i saw once but i do believe that's a superior film and if oh, yeah. you were to watch something based on that material for the show i think it would probably be wages of fear instead of that um yeah. you know well, again it's a it, i'm sure sorcerer is a good movie but as far yeah. as for the podcast itself i don't think it I think Wages of Fear would probably be a better fit for what we're looking for. Yeah. Um, and I think the other films he was known for, To Live and Die in L.A. and Killer yes. Joe, the movie he made with Matthew McConaughey, which is, I guess, over a decade ago. I thought it was just a couple years ago, but it's, it's yeah. kind of old as well. I think those are very good films, too, but I don't know if they quite are, you know, meet the level of what we're looking for um, with what we're aiming for with this podcast. So I would think yeah. French Connection would be the definite yes. shoe in and yes. you know maybe one yeah. of those at a later date yeah yeah for sure uh one other thing that i meant to say um is uh watching the exorcist now with very modern eyes i couldn't help but notice that the catholic church and the catholic priests come off looking pretty good you know it's a pretty positive portrayal of that. They better, because that, that's a different time. You couldn't yes. make them look bad and get away with this movie. <laughs> no. Um, but it's interesting, because now, with all the scandals, all the things that have come out about what priests have been doing, and what the church may or may not have been doing, or at least turning a blind eye to. And so it's, you know, it's kind of interesting to see that at this point, they were just, you know, above reproach. And they were, they really, you know, admirable in this movie and i think it's fine and it works in this movie but but watching it now it's kind of hard to not think about the fact that gee you know i wonder you know what were these guys really up to <laughs> you know you know it's kind really... of interesting because back then you couldn't really go against the church but you could mm -hmm. go against the military because there was a lot of wars being fought there that was just like around you know like should we really be here you know now yeah. um, and obviously a lot of uh, wars leap prior to that but now you if you're anti um patriotism you forget it you know mm -hmm. uh one of the biggest movies of, i think of last year or the year before uh top gun it was all about patriotism you know yeah. if you're anti-patriot patriotism you couldn't get a movie done back then ton of movies full metal jacket you know all, all this oh, yeah anti-war movies it were easy to get done and now yeah. it's the exact opposite like it, it, you know back then you, you couldn't be anti-religion now being anti-religion is not a big deal who cares you know yeah you can do yeah. as many anti-religious stuff as you can so the zeitgeist of like what, what society accepts and how we view things it kind of flipped with, with those two things yeah that's uh that's true that's an interesting point but i wonder if the new exorcist movie which i have not seen i don't I think don't anyone that. has i think that's, <laughs> yeah. that's the problem well and i think the people who have have been fairly 
negative. They wish they, they missed it as well. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I wonder, do they add in any sort of uh, nuance to the Catholic Church and the Catholic priests? Do they deal with that at all? Or are they still just kind of above But approach? that's the problem, though. I think that's the problem with redoing the exorcist is that it's pro- religion and mm -hmm. we're more nuanced with religion now than we were then yeah. so having this you know, and, and there's so many religions that are accepted now than were back then you know it's just yeah. like oh you believe in god and, and jesus and like yeah that's that's ubiquitous you know that's what you do when yeah. you talk about religion now it's like no it's a lot more nuanced you know of, yeah yeah you know, uh, your beliefs and, and things like that and and audiences that you're trying to reach with their different beliefs so it's yeah. hard to have a movie like that that'd be like doing dracula and focusing completely on the religious aspects of dracula there's a religious aspect of dracula with the cross and all that stuff but mm -hmm. if you focus on that you can never get a, a dracula movie made because you know it's too narrow of an audience so yeah. I, I i'm not saying that's the major problem of why the exorcist didn't work but it's one of the problems and that yeah. you have to be pro uh what's 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 the word for catholics i i mispronounced another word earlier in the podcast it's catholicism catholicism, catholicism? Yeah. yeah i was gonna yeah. say catholicism but i'm like let me not fuck up like i did earlier <laughs> but yeah catholicism yeah. it's not it's not ubiquitous anymore it's not something that's just like oh yeah we'll accept that you know yeah. it's 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 too nuanced to be all about that you know yeah yeah for sure and I guess this new Exorcist movie was made by that uh, same guy who did the recent Blumhouse. Halloween. Yeah, yeah. the, the yeah. recent Halloween. They paid trilogy. a lot. They paid a lot of movie for the rights to Exorcism, and it's like, why? You could yeah. just say you could add Exorcism to any title, and it would be just as valuable as if you bought the rights to the Exorcist. You know? Yeah. yeah. How many people even know? You know, the audience yeah. you now like this movie was made in '73 it, or released mm -hmm. in '73. Like yeah. where that's 50 years ago like that's how many right. people yeah. are, like your audience is probably in their 20s like who's who's paying to go to a movie theater probably people in yeah. their 20s or 30s they weren't yeah. even born you know it's yeah. like maybe their parents saw this movie you know so yeah. it's like the, the the name has no value you know yeah and they've certainly made a lot of sort of possession movies in recent years like you could make a movie of a demonic possession you don't have to call it the exorcist or but you could you put know. the exorcist in the title though uh, well, and yeah, still not could. have you yeah. could say american yeah. exorcist and it has yeah. nothing to do with the exorcist That's franchise true. but legally yeah. you can get away with it yeah that is absolutely true and i wonder what they're going to do now because they planned three movies are they going to go through with the other two or are they going to back out of that what do you think they already spent the money. <laughs> so, so, you can't unspend do... the money. You know? No, no, you can't. Are they going to try to do better on the second one then? Forget the first one. We've got a better one now. You know, they're going to. The sequel is going to be a reboot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Oops, that was a mistake. We're starting over. Yeah. 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 That, that must be it. Yeah. Well, the good news is no one saw it, so they only have to apologize to like maybe 10 people. Yeah, that's true. That's helpful to them, I'm sure. Yeah. 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 But, uh, you know, without a doubt, uh, The Exorcist, uh, as I said, I know people who say it's the greatest horror film ever made, and I can't really disagree. You know, uh, I have a hard time picking, you know, my absolute favorites or, you know, the movies I think are absolutely the best, but. But it certainly would be on my list of, of greatest horror films ever made. And um, yeah, I think it's uh, it stands the test of time. You know, it's still as good today as it ever was. I enjoy it every time I see it. Um, yeah, I'm glad to have watched it again. It's been a while. Yeah. For me, it's definitely top 10. Like I said, I have to rewatch it without my preconceived notions of like, yeah, maybe it should be better without the supernatural stuff, you know. Uh, but either way, it's definitely top ten, possibly top five, maybe closest number two. Who knows? There's so many great horror films, and horror yeah. films aren't like other genres. They're not. It's not specific. So it's like you can't say, "Well, what's the greatest slasher film? What's the greatest monster film? What's the greatest vampire film?" If you're encompassing all of horror, it's a lot of movies to consider, you know. Um, yeah. But it's definitely a great movie. Like you said, it stands the test of time. 
And, you know, we're just going to have to agree to disagree. I know you think Paranormal Activity is a far superior <laughs> film. We're just going to have to agree to disagree. I think this is better than Paranormal Activity. I know that hurts uh, your heart to hear. Yeah, that's that's a tough one. But, um, yeah. And occasionally I do hear people say, oh, this movie is like this generation's Exorcist. Or, you know, this movie is as good as The Exorcist. And I don't know. When I watch those movies, I don't think they're as good. I don't think they have it the way The Exorcist has uh, except paranormal activity that one maybe does <laughs> uh, other than that uh, yeah i don't know